All right, so in my last lecture, we talked a little bit about the Progressive Era, and I characterized the Progressive Era as this period in which the attitudes of ordinary Americans started to shift away from the idea that government should be small and should stay out of people's lives to the viewpoint that the government could and should play a positive role in shaping American society in the sense that they should be confronting social issues and that they had the resources at their disposal to fix problems in a way that other organizations simply couldn't. Um, and I mentioned that one of the drivers of this shift in public perception was journalism, in particular magazines and books. I talked about the publication of The Jungle by Upton Sinclair and the role in which that played in the passage of the Pure Food and Drug Act and the Meat Inspection Act, which really kind of established our whole system that we still have going today to create public confidence that the food that we're receiving is clean and what the packaging says it is and that sort of thing. But I wanted to just share with you another example. Um, and this is from your packet. It's called How the Other Half Lives by Jacob Reese. It was published in 1889. And it was really kind of an expose of the conditions that people were living under in terms of like factory workers and like the the housing that they lived in because a lot of them were living in these small cramped spaces multiple families in a single room apartment this sort of thing and so he was a reporter for the new york tribune he spent 12 years working on the lower east side around people that lived in these slums and he decided to publish this book that really kind of highlighted what those conditions were like and brought them the, to the attention of your ordinary American. So when I'm reading this, I want you to just pay attention to the sensory words that Reese uses. So what sights, sounds, and smells are described in this. Be a little careful, please. The hall is dark, and you might stumble over the children pitching pennies back there. Not that it would hurt them, Kicks and cuffs are their daily diet. They have little else. Here where the hall turns and dives into utter darkness is a step, and another, and another, a flight of stairs. You can feel your way if you cannot see it. Close? Yes. What would you have? All the fresh air that enters these stairs comes from the hall door that is forever slamming, and from the windows of dark bedrooms that in turn receive from the dares their sole supply of the elements god meant to be free but man deals out with such a cheap hand there was a woman filling her pail by the hydrant you just bumped against the sinks are in the hallway that all tenants may have access and all are poisoned alike by their summer stenches hear the pump squeak it is the lullaby of tenement house babes in summer when a thousand thirsty throats pant for a cooling drink in this block, it has worked in vain. But the saloon, whose open door you passed in the hall, is always there. The smell of it has followed you up. Here is a door. Listen. The short, hacking cough, the tiny, helpless wail. What do, you, what do they mean? They mean that the soiled bow of a white sign of recent birth you saw on the door downstairs will have another story to tell. Oh, a sadly familiar story. Before the day is at the end, the child is dying with measles. With half a chance it might have lived, but it lived, but it had none. The dark bedroom killed it. It was took all of a sudden, says the mother, soothing the throbbing little body with her trembling hands. There is no unkindness in the rough voice of the man in the jumper who sits by the window grimly smoking a clay pipe, with the little life ebbing out in his sight bitter as his words sound. Hush, Mary, if we cannot keep the baby, need we complain such as we? So what he's describing is just how commonplace such an exceptional event, a group of parents losing their child to a disease, and the way in which, you know, the mother, as she trembles, watching her child die. But the dad is so desensitized to this. He's saying, you know, 
do we need to complain about this? He's trying to cheer his wife up, and he's trying to be supportive, but it's such a common sight here, right? It says it's a sadly familiar story. He does an excellent job of showing just how familiar these horrific sights and sounds can be. So let's move on to the next half. Such as we, what if the words ring in your ears as we grope our way up the stairs and down from floor to floor, listening to the sounds behind the closed doors, some of the quarreling, some of coarse songs, more of profanity. They are true. When the summer heats come, and with their suffering, they have meaning more terrible than words can tell. Come over here. Step carefully over this baby. It is a baby, spite of its rags and dirt, under these iron bridges called fire escapes, but loaded down despite the incessant watchfulness of the firemen with broken household goods, with wash tubs and barrels, over which no man could climb from a fire. This gap between dingy brick walls is the yard. That strip of smoke-colored sky up there is the heaven of these people. Do you wonder the name does not attract them to the churches? The baby's parents live in the rear tenement here. She is at least as clean as the steps we are now climbing. There are plenty houses with half a hundred such in. The tenement is much like the one in the front we just left, only fouler, fouler, closer, darker. We will not say more cheerless. The word is a mockery. A hundred thousand people lived in rear tenements in New York last year. Here is a room neater than the rest. The woman, a stout matron of hard lines of care in her face, is at the wash tub. I try to keep the children clean, she says apologetically, with a hopeless glance around. The spice of hot soap suds is added to the air already tainted with the smell of boiling cabbage, of rags and uncleanliness all about. So I want you to think as you go in to answer the questions on the Lesson 3 evaluation. What do you think life was like for your ordinary average American worker in the late 1800s, uh, both in the factory and at home? You know, what was the life they could afford to build for themselves? And what did that mean for their existence?